Our relationship with China is a very good relationship. I wish they told us three months sooner that this was a problem. We didn't know about it. They knew about it, and they should have told us. We could have saved a lot of lives throughout the world. But I'm a little upset with China, I'll be honest with you, because as much as I, I like President Xi and as much as I respect the country and, and admire the country, I have great admiration for the country, what they've done in a short period of time. Of course, our presidents, our previous presidents, allowed that to happen. You should say thank you very much to all of them. But uh, they should have told us about this. And I did ask him, whether or not we could send some people in, they didn't want that. Out of pride, I think really out of pride. They don't want, they don't want us sending people into China to help them. You know, China's a strong country. They have, uh, they have their scientists and they have their doctors, very smart, a lot of people. I, you know, but I did discuss that about sending our people in. And uh, they didn't really respond. We went again, they didn't respond. If they went in, they would have been able to tell us, give us a much earlier indication. But we had an early indication. That's why I closed out China. I mean, I felt it was my instinct, but that's why I closed out China at a very early time. This information is coming from uh, random actors around the world, but often, too, coming from places like the Chinese Communist Party, from Russia, from uh, Iran. Those are, those are nations that want to undermine what we're doing here, our dem democracy, our freedom, uh, the way that we're responding to this uh, risk, uh, to the Wuhan virus. Uh, they want to undermine our activities. We're doing great work. The American people have responded to the things the president has asked them to do to keep themselves, their families, and their communities safe. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't permit this information to undermine our activity. Stands today among the great pillars of American health and financial security, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and the Affordable Care Act. Now we find ourselves in the depths of one of the most serious health and economic emergencies our nation has ever faced. The protections of the Affordable Care Act are more important now than ever. But right now, in the middle of the coronavirus, the Trump administration is in court suing to tear down the entire Affordable Care Act, every last protection and benefit. If President Trump succeeds in striking down the ACA in court, Gone is the ban on insurers putting limits on your health care. Gone are guaranteed essential health benefits and free preventive services. Gone are young people staying on their parents' insurance until age 26. Gone is the health insurance of 20 million Americans. And gone are the life-saving protections for more than 130 million Americans with pre-existing conditions. Today, therefore, I'm calling on President Trump to abandon his lawsuit seeking to strike down the Affordable Care Act. Instead, the President should urge the 14 states who have refused to expand Medicaid to do so. Last Thursday, Pope Francis offered the world this prayer. Enlighten those responsible for the common good so that they might know how to care for those entrusted to their responsibility. Today, House Democrats are unveiling the Take Responsibility for Workers and Families Act, a bill that takes responsibility for the health, wages, and well-being of America's workers. Democrats take responsibility for our workers. We require that any corporation that takes taxpayer dollars must protect their workers' wages and benefits, not CEO pay, stock buybacks, or layoffs. We strengthen unemployment insurance so that it can replace the average wages of our workers who are losing their jobs and hours. For our small businesses, we provide fast relief with grants and loans to tide them through this crisis. For our doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, and first respondents, responders in hospitals and other health institutions, we provide desperately needed funds to care for those who are sick and to ensure uh, that our providers have personal protective equipment, PPE, that they need. We protect our healthcare workers by requiring the administration to enforce our stronger OSHA protections. For our families, we give direct payments to America's families in a robust way and strengthen the child tax credits and the earned income tax credit. We give more workers the security of guaranteed paid family and medical leave, including those caring for our seniors and we make the coronavirus treatment free for the patient. 
for our students. We provide emergency funds for our schools and universities. We help current borrowers with their student debt burden and the GI Bill benefits. We bolster SNAP and other initiatives to address food insecurity. For our democracy, we ensure that states can carry out this year's election and require early voting and vote by mail. I'm grateful to our committee chairs and members uh, for their extraordinary leadership and work for America's workers and families. The Senate Republican bill put corporations first, but because of the insistence of leader Chuck Schumer and Senate Democrats, progress has been made. We urge the, Sem the Senate to move closer to the values in the Take Responsibility for Workers and Families Act. We must be bold and forward-looking in our thinking. We must be swift and evidence-based in our actions, and we must be prayerful. God bless the families of those who've lost loved ones and those fighting this terrible illness now. God blesses our nurses, doctors, first responders, and men and women in uniform. God bless the men and women in our factories making medical supplies, cars, all of it, and those keeping our grocery shelves stocked with food. God bless the scientists racing to find a cure. God bless all of you, and may God always bless America. Thank you. The men and women of the Mercy are highly trained professionals and are eager to join this fight to start helping their fellow Americans. In the next couple of weeks, our other hospital ship, the Comfort, will head to New York City for the same purpose. The crew and staff are already making the necessary preparations for the upcoming mission. I had the chance to speak to that ship's captain as well. Concurrently, we have a number of military field hospitals and expeditionary medical units on prepared to deploy orders that will be moving out this week. The Army Corps of Engineers is also set to begin work to convert hotels, dormitories, and other buildings into temporary medical facilities across the country. U.S. Army North has activated 10 defense coordinating elements co-located with each FEMA regional headquarters to synchronize requests for federal military assistance. FEMA as the lead agency for the federal response, will validate and prioritize these requests. The Department of Defense will then deploy our forces around the country to provide this support as directed. Additionally, the department continues to provide logistical support to American citizens around the world. Last Friday, for example, we flew members of a U.S. women's football team home from Honduras after the country closed its borders. We continue to keep our service members, civilians, and family members around the world informed on the latest force health protection guidance. Today, we are elevating the Pentagon reservation status to health protection condition C, Charlie. This limits uh, the number of access points to the Pentagon and increases the amount of personnel who will telework, among a few other things. Tomorrow, we will publish updated guidance on elective surgeries as we look for additional ways to free up medical capacity and resources to focus on COVID-19 related treatment. In general, it is important that we all continue to employ protective measures, including good hand washing, proactive medical screening, and social distancing. These can dramatically decrease the risk of infection and slow the spread of virus. The United States military remains well prepared to defend the nation. Although we have scaled back some of our major exercises, routine training continues across all services to ensure our forces maintain a high state of readiness. I trust our commanders to make the best decisions for their units as they balance mission requirements with force health protection. I'm proud of our service members and DOD civilians and families who are answering the call all around our great country. I want to thank them for their contributions to this fight. By working together, we will defeat this virus, and I'm confident that our nation will come back even stronger. Thank you. And we'll Let's now take, take some, questions. some questions. We're going to go to the phone lines. Lita with AP. Hi. Uh, thanks for doing this, and hi to everyone in the, uh, in the briefing room. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, two questions. One, can you provide some additional details on the number of field hospitals and other um, hospital units that the U.S. military is making available and when and where you think they may go? And then secondly, what impact do you think some of this is having on readiness? There are a number of Navy sailors who have uh, become ill. Can you just give us a, an assessment of uh, what impact you're seeing so far on readiness both in the United States and in war zones. Thank you. Thanks, Lita. So we have a number of hospitals uh, and medical facilities, uh, expeditionary mil medical facilities across all three services. We have put on what we call PTDO, prepared to deploy orders, five such units uh, that will be prepared to deploy. Uh, we will, of course, take our sourcing guidance from FEMA, but right now I anticipate sending a, a hospital to Seattle and a hospital to New York City 
And beyond that, once that's confirmed, uh, we will look at sending to other places. And as necessary, we will continue to alert uh, units to prepare to deploy and then deploy them as appropriate. With regard to uh, readiness, uh, we have, as, as some of you know, we have 133 military personnel who have contracted the virus. Um, and we are taking great care of them, watching them closely. I've had a chance to talk to several of them to, to check on them. Uh, as this uh, virus ramps up and spreads, we'll obviously see more and more impact of persons in our ranks. Uh, I'm confident that, that while it may have some impact on readiness, it will not affect our ability to con uh, conduct our national security missions uh, both at home and abroad. So I'm very confident in terms of, again, the fitness, the health of our force and the uh, commander's ability to make sure they manage uh, our, our resources and our people. Keep in mind, I've always outlined three priorities. Number one, protecting our people uh, and their families. Number two, ensuring safeguarding we uh, have our mission capabilities available to us. And then number three, supporting the whole of nation uh, government effort. Jennifer Griffin. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Secretary Esper, um, last week we heard that the Army had excess capacity to test, about 16,000 tests they could run a day, but they're running at a very small amount of that. Why isn't the military helping the civilian labs with testing to ease the backload? And if I could just ask quickly a question about Afghanistan, why did Secretary of State Pompeo feel the need to go out to Afghanistan? Uh, from your perspective, uh, is that is the so-called peace deal in jeopardy, and have you slowed the number of troops coming out of Afghanistan? Well, I don't want to get too much into Afghanistan today. Uh, I want to speak about coronavirus, but I will say I spoke to Secretary Pompeo, Pompeo earlier today. He's obviously over there to, 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 to try and keep the process moving forward. Uh, otherwise, he'll be, uh, he'll be coming back. I'm sure he'll speak to it more broadly uh, once he returns to the United States. On your first question, I've already forgotten what the first question was. About testing. Testing. So, uh, so we have 16 labs available. Um, we can tre uh, test at least 6,000 a day is our throughput. I, I don't know where the 16,000 number came from, but I think we're up to 6,000 6, in terms of capacity. The issue is test kits. And uh, as more of those come on board, we can test more. But uh, we have offered, again, those uh, services up to um, the interagency to, to provide testing as we have excess capacity in our labs. And if my numbers are wrong, somebody will clean it up afterwards. But I think that's the last time I was briefed. Those were the, roughly the numbers. Go to Courtney. Uh, I just want to be clear on the field hospitals. So the ones going to Seattle and New York City, you expect those to move out this week? Yeah, so uh, and I just want to clarify, there's, so there's no confu confusion. There are hospitals being provided. Uh, by HHS. Uh, I forget what exactly they are called, but they are hospitals in the sense of beds, bed space, things like that. Those are being provided to, uh, to Seattle and I uh, forget the other location. It might have been New York as well. Uh, we are looking at deploying our field hospitals, which include the hospital, the equipment, and, and medical professionals. And my aim is to get them out this week. Uh, my, my view is Seattle and New York City are the places. We just need FEMA to validate that, because keep in mind, FEMA is the U.S. government's central place for handling requests and then validating them and then prioritizing them. So that's important. But that was my, my notion is we'll be moving out this week. And then can you just give us a little more detail about changing the health protection condition to C? at the Pentagon, exactly what that means. How many, uh, we, I think we've, a lot of us here have been talking about how many people are actually working in the building right now yeah. prior to that, and then how, where you expect that number to is now and where it will go to under C. Yeah, we can, we can get you those numbers on who's working in the building now. I think it's down considerably, maybe 60 some percent, if not more. Again, I'm working off of numbers I was given last week. Uh, there, there does come with uh, uh, HB Con Charlie additional measures. We talked about limiting the number of sites. Uh, some screening is we could go to medical screening in terms of temperature testing as people come in is another uh, action that uh, is looked at. And then, uh, of course, everybody swiping as they come in. So there are a number of things. Uh, we should be putting out information more today. Uh, there is no intent whatsoever, Barbara, to limit the access of the press. And uh, we want to keep the building open again for certainly for essential personnel and for the media. Thank you. 